Yeah, like I said, it was a, it's a privilege for me to be here. I was in um, Chennai, I guess, about a year ago, uh, last October. It was um, a little bit warmer than it is now. But uh, I'm, I'm happy to be back, and I think um, uh, it's always a privilege for me to come to IITM because I've had many PhD students from here, and they've all done fabulous. So it's, it's good for me to observe, see what's in the water here. Um, so the, um, uh, what, I'm going to, what I'll be talking about, I guess, for seven and a half hours with, with you all, I guess we have five sessions at an hour and a half, or, or if that sounds right. Um, a, a lot of the work that I do is on fundamental combustion problems that arise out of what I would call steady flowing combustion devices. And by steady flowing, I'm differentiating that from um, internal combustion engines or things where, where it's an intrinsically uh, transient combustion process. But it still turns out that in steady flowing combustion devices, there's a whole host of very, very interesting problems that arise um, which have very significant practical influence, but yet understanding them and modeling them and predicting them and controlling them requires a really deep dive into fundamental combustion physics. And, and in particular, the, the areas where I work and where I'm most interested are at the intersection of uh, combustion sciences, fluid mechanics, and, and acoustics. And so that's really where, where most of my work falls at that, at that intersection. In fact, the, um, the textbook that um, I wrote, Unsteady Combustor Physics, was really the idea of that book was to introduce students. I really wrote that book for my students after having after having brought a whole lot of students up to speed on those three separate topics. The reason that I wrote that textbook was really for my students to, as, a, as a single source to help them understand the um, really the fields of, of unsteady chemically reacting flows. Uh, so I'm not going to be spending much time talking about kinetics here. There's, you have much better experts with, with the other lectures, but really what I'm going to be focusing on are chemically reacting flows, particularly unsteady chemically reacting flows. And so this, this blue box here, this just highlights is that, that um, what, I, what I want to focus on are the physical chemical processes and, the, and particularly the intersection of those processes that control various combustion processes that ultimately influence the operational limits of practical devices. So there's all kinds of very interesting combustion problems out there. What I'm going to be focusing attention on with, with you over the next three days is I'll be thinking about an application and I'm going to be flowing that back to some of the fundamental science questions. And so the, uh, the outline is, is here. So for the next 45 minutes, I just want to introduce some of these, these combustion problems that, that I've, I've just identified. So for example, we're going to talk a little bit about blowouts, or we're going to talk about flashback. Problems you've probably seen in um, some of your combustion courses. But what I want to show you is, is that there's actually a whole lot more to those problems than sort of some of the classical treatments of them um, when you start looking at high velocity combustor flows. I want to talk about the, um, th then we're going to be talking about flame aerodynamics. And by flame aerodynamics, what I mean is the interaction of flames with the flow field. All right, how the flow, obviously where the flame sits and what the flame is doing is a function of the flow. But in the same way, the flame changes the flow field. And so the problem is intrinsically coupled and you get and, and the problem of flashback is one of these types of problems where you can't understand um, many features of flashback if you treat the flow as in being imposed on the flame. Uh, but, but you have to fully understand the coupling. Um, another good example of flame aerodynamics would be the, uh, what's called the Darius-Landau instability, whereby the flame changes the flow, which then changes the flame position, which changes the flow, and, and it causes disturbances on the flames to, uh, to grow. Um, so then what we'll talk about, so, so that, that work is going to have most direct relevance to the, to the flashback problem. Then we'll spend three hours talking about problems arising around flame stabilization. Specifically what I want to talk about is flame stretch, uh, the stretching of premixed flames, um, the extinction of premixed flames. I want to talk about edge flames. So what happens when a 
a premixed flame has, or in a non premixed flame has an edge. It, do, it doesn't go on forever, but it has an edge. And, and we'll talk about how there are some new degrees of freedom there. So that's C. So flashbacks um, is B. C is motivated by the problem of flame stabilization. And then D and E, what I'm gonna, these are motivated by the problem of combustion instabilities. And I want to talk about first very generically about disturbances in chemically reacting flows, how they're generated, how they propagate. And I'm going to introduce a, what, a, a canonical decomposition of disturbances, what's called the, you can decompose an, an arbitrary disturbance field into, into what are called vortical modes, acoustic modes, and entropy modes. And we'll talk about that. And then the last topic, which is a topic very near and dear to my heart, is how flames respond to being disturbed. All right. How flames respond to disturbance is a really, really interesting generic problem. In, in essence, the, the turbulent combustion problem is a problem of how flames respond to disturbances. Um, what I'm going to be specifically focusing on is how flames respond to periodic disturbances. And, and again, that's motivated by the combustion instability problem. And in particular, in, if, I, if I refer back to the turbulent combustion problem, really the key thing we're oftentimes interested in turbulent combustion is what are the influences of stochastic disturbances on time average burning rates? Um, for the combustion instability problem, we're not necessarily interested in time average burning rates, but unsteady burning rates. Um, and what are the influences of periodic disturbances on the unsteady burning rates? So that's just a quick roadmap of, of um, what I intend to discuss, and I think what we'll do is we'll just start out with this, well, with A, which, which is just kind of the first 45 minutes, I just kind of want to motivate some of the problems that we're going to talk about. And so first of all, I just want to talk a little bit about constraints and metrics. And so a lot of the work that I do is on gas turbine combustion. Um, gas turbines is the dominant source of, of, of power generation capacity in the world, so it's a very interesting practical application, but also a, a lot of these, the, a lot of this motivation that I'm going to that I'm going to talk about is, is generically applicable to any steady flowing combustion device, a boiler, a water heater, or something like that. Um, so if we want to think about sort of from, and, and again, there, there's two ways you can, that we can go with this. We can start with very fundamentals and feed those up to applications, or start with applications and think about the fundamental problems that, that are needed to address it. And I'm, going to, and I'm going to start with the latter. And so what I have here is a list. Uh, for a, a gas turbine combustor or any steady flowing combustion device, the, the, the critical combustion performance parameters. So what, what, what makes a combustor a good combustor or what would make a combustor a bad combustor? Well, the first one is it needs to burn all the fuel. That one's kind of obvious. And generally, that's a non-issue. Um, the only application where this is an issue would be maybe for a military application if you'd have an afterburner. A military after application with an afterburner at high altitudes, you may have an issue with, with burning all the fuel. But in general, that's not, that's not an issue. Um, another one is ignition. And by this, I'm going to specifically be referring to forced ignition. Um, Professor Sashadri spent some time talking about auto ignition, which, I'll, uh, which um, I have down here. But what I'm talking about here is forced ignition, um, the ability to ignite when you want the system to ignite. So you know, I've, I flew here on a British Airways. Um, Boeing 787, which has a, uh, what is it, a, a uh, it was a Rolls-Royce engine. I forgot the name of the Rolls-Royce engine. But an enormous amount of effort and money was spent by Rolls-Royce to certify that that engine could ignite when it's supposed to. All right? And the most, probably the most severe condition is, is at a high altitude condition. Right? So when a plane is flying at 40,000 feet and the flame blows out, they have to certify that when they pop the igniter that the flame will come back, all right? Which, as you can probably imagine, is very cold. It's very low pressure, very low temperature. It's a really challenging, really challenging um, um, design metric. From a, for power generation devices, as I mentioned, gas turbines are oftentimes used for generating electric power. And, and there, what you basically do is you take the, the, the um, rather than expanding the exhaust gases, uh, well, you expand them all the way through a turbine, and then you, then you attach a generator to it. It's very important that when you hit, again, when you hit the igniter, that the system actually ignite. 
Um, because if it doesn't, you're, you're blowing an enormous amount of fuel through one of these heavy-duty industrial power generation plants, and it causes an explosion hazard. Um, so again, ignition is very important. Pattern factor is the next one that I have here. Pattern or factor, this refers to the temperature uniformity of the gases exiting the combustor. This is not so much a combustion problem. It's really more of a fluid mechanics, aerodynamics problem. So I'm really not going to be talking about it. But I just will emphasize that it's, that it's, that it's a very important issue. Um, operability. We're going to spend a good bit of time talking about operability issues. And so these are the, these are the, um, the combustion issues which influence the overall operational envelope of the combustion device. So one of the things to realize, again, so let me, let's just talk about gas turbines specifically. If you want to think about, for those of you who have taken a propulsion class, you might ask, where does the combustor show up in your propulsion class? You know, if you, you, when you take propulsion, you have these black boxes, right? You have a compressor, which is a box, and, and a combustor, and a turbine, and maybe an exhaust nozzle. Um, and if you think about things like um, specific thrust or specific fuel consumption, what are, what are those parameters functions of? Well, for example, specific fuel consumption. Well, for a, for a Brayton cycle, the specific fuel consumption is of, of an ideal cycle is a function of only one parameter. What parameter is that? Compressor pressure ratio, right? That's independent of the combustor. Or um, the specific thrust of a, uh, of, a, of a propulsion gas turbine. It's a function of what what parameter or parameters? Yep, turbine inlet temperature and compressor pressure ratio, right? Again, the combustor doesn't show up. So some of these macro cycle, cycle parameters that define the, the, the macro performance of a, of a gas turbine, actually the combustor, at least for an ideal cycle, that doesn't show up. It's measured by basically the maximum temperature you can shove through the turbine, which controls the, the power density of the device and the compressor pressure ratio, which controls the, um, the, the, the thermal efficiency and the specific fuel consumption. Now, those obviously set some boundary conditions on the combustor, right? So for example, we know that as you go up and if, if you want to get a, have, a, have a cycle with higher thermal efficiency, you need to have a higher compressor pressure ratio. And what that means is that you need to be able to operate at higher pressures. So again, Professor Sashadri was talking about how he's got this very, very nice facility, and they're, they've upgraded it from 25 bar to 60 bar. So 60 bar, that's pretty, and that's where aircraft engines are going, um, which, which, you know, so it raises this whole issue around what are, what are the, the kinetic rates, what are extinction strain rates, and, and things like that at, at those types of pressures. Um, but again, the, those are kind of boundary conditions where the combustor just needs to operate within, at a given pressure, and it needs to operate at a certain fuel air ratio to give you the turbine inlet temperature. But these, these operability parameters, these are actually where the combustor actually influences where the engine can operate. All right? So I come from, I'm, I live in Atlanta, Georgia, which is a distinct region of the United States called the southeast part, which has a distinctive culture called southern culture. And southern culture in the United States has its own expressions and manners of speaking, as, as any region does. And um, one of the expressions, and I'm sure it translates around the world in, in, in southern culture is that if mama's not happy, nobody's happy. <laughs> I mean, does that translate into, into uh, if, if, you're, if your mother's not happy, then, then, then no one's happy in the whole household. So, so as I was just saying that, that where does the combustor show up? You know, it's compressor pressure ratio, it's turbulent temperature. Well, if, if the combustor's not happy, nobody's happy, right? Um, so for example, blowout. If the flame chooses to not show up, if the flame chooses to leave the engine, right, nothing works, right? Um, you can have an awesome engine with a beautiful compressor and turbine and whatever, but if the flame blows out, it's, it's gone and, and nothing's working. If you have a violent combustion instability, which is just shaking and rattling the system and destroying parts, um, if you have, in premix system, you can have something called flashback, where the flame propagates upstream. We'll actually be talking about that today. That very, very quickly causes damage, damages parts and breaks parts. Or if you get a phenomenon called autoignition, also important in premix systems, where the fuel and the air prematurely, they ignite where they're not supposed to. 
Okay, so these are operability parameters. So again, these these set sort of if you if you were to make an operational map of where an engine can and can't operate. In many cases, the combustor sets very important influences on operational envelopes. And so where that feeds into the job of, of all of us in this room here is being able to model that so we don't have nasty surprises and hopefully being able to mitigate those influences so that if you have this device, it can operate as flexibly and as efficiently as, and, as over a wide and operating range as possible, and so the combustor is not, not constraining where the system can operate. Okay, all right, and, and so low pollutant emissions. I think this one's obvious, uh, that, that the combustor is the source of, of all of the pollutant emissions from a, from a thermal energy device, whether it is, um, uh, you know, in, in, in the typical category pollutants are things like uh, nitric oxides, carbon monoxide, particulates and things like that. Fuel flexibility, this is an important one. This is a really important one. Um, and it's particularly an important one for premix systems. So premix systems are the types of systems which are increase, increasingly being used because with premix systems you can control the flame temperature and, and you can have low NOx. One of the big challenges, as, as I'll get into with, with these premix systems, is that you, you lose a lot in terms, am I standing in front of this? I'm sorry. The, uh, you, you lose a lot in terms of operational flexibility. So, so with premix systems, you, the other thing that you lose oftentimes is fuel flexibility. And so having a system uh, where you can operate with a range of fuels and a range of fuel compositions is really, really important. Um, and again, Professor Sashadri was referring to some of these Air Force initiatives where they're trying to look at all these different fuel compositions. A big question that they have is, is the fuel flexibility question. That if you have a system that's been certified as being able to, say, meet a high altitude relight condition, what happens if you make a change in fuel composition from something which is traditional Jet A to something which is maybe coal derived Fisher Tropes fuel? Is a, is a big question. Good turndown. Um, this refers to the ability to operate the system over a whole range of power settings, right? If you have a if you have an aircraft engine, you want the aircraft engine not only to work at full power during takeoff, you want it to be able to idle or to be able to operate a cruise. Or if you have a power plant, um, you want a system that can operate over a whole range of, of, of power settings. Um, and then finally, transient response, being able to operate um, in a dynamic environment. And I'll, and I'll give, a, and I'm going to dive into a few of these a little bit later. Okay, so just to motivate some of these things, I want to very quickly motivate. Um, give a quick refresher on premix and non-premix flames. Everyone in this room will, will know the difference, but I just want to make a couple quick points. So, if we um, if we think about a premix flame, and this is just a, a notional schematic, what we're looking at here is a system where we have a flow that's going left to right. Um, the, the key idea here is is that we have this mixing section where fuel and air are mixing upstream of the flame, right? And by doing that, what we do is we have the ability to control the mixture stoichiometry at the flame. And this is the standard method which is used in, in low NOx combustion devices, whether it's low NOx combustion boilers. Um, in the United States, where I live, NOx is not regulated for water heaters or for home heating. But in countries, many countries in the European Union, NOx emissions are regulated. And so premixed combustors are also used for, for, for water heaters, for, for um, heating for people's homes and things like that. Um, but the, but the, the, again, the, the, the key reason that we would be looking at premix flames is the idea that you, by, you can control mixture stoichiometry, and by controlling mixture stoichiometry, you can operate with low flame temperatures, and therefore you can slow down Zeldovich NOx. And you can, that way you can drive down thermal NOx levels. Um, now, in a non-premix system, you know, um, my little notional schematic here is the fuel and the air are being separately introduced into the system. And so what happens there is the, as, as you all know, the mixture burn, the, this, I lost the Greek letter here, this should be phi. The mixture is going to burn that, that the, um, wh where, where the reaction happens is, is, is at an equivalence ratio of one. So you, you can't control the stoichiometry. And so with these non premixed flames, you have a, locally the flame temperature is hot. You produce a lot of NOx. You also produce soot. However, these devices are also very simple 
They're very robust. Um, as we'll talk about, you know, turndown is a big is a big issue. If you have a system where it's difficult to to, to throttle the amount of airflow rate, suppose that you really can't change the airflow rate through the system. If you want to get half the power out of the system, that means you need to put half the fuel into the system. With a non premix system, no problem. You put half the fuel into the system, the flame just gets a little bit shorter. All that excess air just goes around. It doesn't participate in the reaction. It mixes with the hot combustion products of your non premix flame to give you whatever the global fuel air ratio, adiabatic temperature, flame temperature would be, and so forth. With a premix system, if you cut the fuel by a factor of two, you just drop your stoichiometry by a factor of two. And then you very quickly move out of flammability ranges or into conditions where the flame wants to blow off. And so issues around, um, and, and so what this means is in premix systems, they're usually much, much more complicated. Um, for, for a power generation gas turbine example, the nozzles for a non premix system might cost $100,000 for, for a whole power plant. For a premix system, it might cost $2 million. Okay, so that's 20 times as much by going from that to that. And the reason for that is, is that you have, rather than having a single nozzle, you might have five or six nozzles. Rather than having a single big fuel control valve, you might have two or three fuel control valves. And you have a very complicated staging schemes and fuel injection schemes and things like that. Um, so, um, just to add two more pictures, just to kind of further fill this out. So if we think about a conventional uh, non premix flame combustor, this would, be, this would be like an aircraft engine combustor. The way these devices work, again, flow is going left to right. You have the, the primary zone, which is where the reaction is happening. And then you, so what's happening is air is coming in. Some fraction is going into the primary zone. The rest is coming in downstream. And so I have just a notional plot here of temperature as a function of, of downstream location. This temperature at the exit of the combustor, that's the turbine inlet temperature. That's, that is generally, that's going to be controlled by a global fuel air ratio, usually, which is a parameter which is given to the combustor designer. Um, but the distribution of the temperature within the system is, um, you know, this is, this is, this is, the, the combustor designer has, has, has complete freedom over that. So in a non premix system, what you do is you have roughly stoichiometric primary zone, high temperature, and then you're adding air downstream, and so the temperature is dropping. Um, uh, and, and so in this picture, we have what's called axial staging of the air. The air is being, um, is, is, is we're, we're, we're adding air downstream. If it was, if the fuel was staged, we would, we would have, which you do in many cases, you would also be adding fuel at multiple axial locations downstream. Now, in contrast, in a premix system, the temperature distribution would look much more like this. And by the way, ignore this. This is just PowerPoint auto smoothing my curve. But um, what you have is essentially a flat temperature and, and so the whole idea is, is that you want to minimize any temperature overshoot. So your flame temperature is really, really close to your turbine inlet temperature or your combustor exit temperature. I've tried to draw this curve with a slight downward slope just to indicate that you need a little bit of cooling air, so you're adding some film cooling just to protect your combustor walls. But a key difference here is, is that in the non premix system, a typical design maybe 30, 40 percent of the air is coming through this, into this primary zone. The rest is getting added downstream. In a premix system, almost all the air goes through the front end of the combustion chamber. Um, very little is available for cooling. And it, we're going to come back to this when we talk about combustion instabilities. It turns out that this, this difference right here has very profound influences on the op one important operability characteristic of premix systems which is their propensity to become thermoacoustically unstable. Now, as I mentioned, when we talk about these different operability issues, all of these things are interacting and trading off with each other. You know? So as I mentioned, with premix systems, you're, 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 you're going premix to minimize NOx, but you're going to be worrying about CO at part load. But now you're, you're worried about the flame blowing off. You're worried about turndown. Um, you're worried about combustion instabilities. All these things are interacting with, with, with cost and complexity. So they're all, they're all trading off and interacting with each other. Um, I have, by the way, the sleeves, all these slides, I think, I believe are on the web. And I'm going to have a lot more slides here than I'm going to have time to go through. So don't feel stressed that you're missing something. If I 
splits through a couple slides. Um, I, I put more here than, than I'm going to have time to, but I just put them here in case someone has a specific question. Let, let's just, I, I just want to quickly talk a little bit more about some of these, these different operability concerns. Um, we can start with combustion instability. So this is um, combustion instability. These are large acoustic oscillations inside of a combustion chamber. Um, it turns out that, that um, combustion chamber is like an organ pipe. You know, if you're familiar with an organ, it makes beautiful music. You blow air through a, through a pipe, and, it, and, it, and, it re there, you, and it, there's a natural acoustic mode, and it resonates. Well, in the same way, a combustion chamber is just a, very, just a fancy piece of pipe. Um, and you can get very violent oscillation, because what happens is, is the flame makes sound. The sound propagates. It reflects off of walls. It comes back, and it disturbs the flame. And, and as we'll talk about, actually, the last hour, on Friday, we'll talk about that flames are very, very sensitive to these disturbances. If you, have a, if you have a flow disturbance, it causes the rate of heat release to oscillate. This is actually a simulation from Professor Menon, who will be talking later. Um, he does a, he, this is a large eddy simulation. The yellow is the instantaneous flame. The blue is a vorticity contour. And so what's happening here, this is a movie. Which I'm not sure it's linked. Yeah, um, this is nominally a movie, but the whole flow is oscillating back and forth. It's exciting. There's a shear layer here. It's exciting these vortices which convect downstream and they disturb the flame. This right here shows some of the damage. This is what's called a transition piece. This connects the combustor to the turbine. In a, in a can combustion system, you have cans. You have can combustion systems and they have to get transitioned to an annular uh, passage to go into the turbine. And that happens in this transition piece. You go from a round combustor exit to a section of an annulus, and that whole, sh this is not a cooling hole, um, that shouldn't be there. And um, guess where it went? It went through the most expensive part of the power plant, which is the, those rotating turbine blades, which cost, you know, $50,000 a blade or something like that. They're grown from a single crystal. You know, this hole right here probably cost some poor soul $30 million, um, which is a lot of money. But it, and it's due to a, the combustion instability, which is this very interesting problem, like I talked about earlier, at the intersection of kinetics, fluid mechanics, and acoustics. Um, I talked about turndown, but let me just show you a slide uh, just, just to illustrate this point. Um, this, is a, this is data, actually, from a power plant in the US showing load as a function of time. And what you can see is happening here is it's turning on, it's kind of doing something here, but basically it's really only operating between about 60 and 100 percent load. It can't operate below 60 percent load. What's happening here with this power plant is, is the reason this, this plant, this, I don't know, $400 million power plant, which you'd nominally like to be able to operate wherever you'd like it to, um, is the reason that it's, you'll, you'll, you see it never operating steady state below 60% load is a combustion problem, is, is that it goes out of compliance on carbon monoxide emissions. At, at low powers, you get lower flame temperatures. The CO formed by the flame takes, in, takes a long time to oxidize. In fact, it takes, by the, once it, it exits the combustion chamber, it effectively freezes. <coughs> and you just start spitting out hundreds of parts per million of carbon monoxide. And, you simply can't operate there. So generally, the range over which you can operate a power plant uh, uh, is controlled by a combustion phenomenon, um, carbon monoxide emissions at part load. So again, this is where, com this is where combustion matters. Um, another one is transient response. This is data from another power plant in the US showing the, uh, this is also is from a, a, a gas turbine fired power plant. And this is showing the power output as a function of time. This was in days. This, this is a power plant, I believe, in the Northeast. This one is in minutes. Look at how the power plant, how the output is just bouncing all over. So what, what particularly um, locations in, in Europe and in the United States where there's very high penetration of renewables, particularly photovoltaics and wind, which are what we call non-dispatchable, right? They're, uh, they're, they do what they want. You don't tell them what they tell you, right? Wind blows when it will, and it won't blow when it won't. And you don't. And the sun shines when it wants to, and the clouds go over the 
sun when they want to. And so what that happens is, is the other thermal plants have to, have to um, adjust their power output accordingly. And so, again, in the United States, the, the, the state of Texas, for instance, has about 30% of the overall electricity produced by wind. And the wind is just bouncing all over the place. And that's, and that's what you're seeing here. But this creates some interesting combustion challenges because you um, oftentimes, it's diff when, you, when you have to have the combustion system responding to these transients, it can actually cause the flame to blow out or to flash back. Um, I'll, give you, I'll give you a simple example. If you have to, let, let me just do an aircraft engine example, because this is where the problem is, is quite severe. Murgy will be very familiar with this problem, because it, it was part of his PhD thesis. But it turns out that the rate at which an aircraft engine can increase or decrease its power is controlled by the combustion chamber, not by the turbo machinery, but by the combustion chamber. Because if, um, suppose that you want to decelerate an aircraft engine, all right? So the way you decelerate it is you just put less fuel into the combustion chamber. That decreases the power and, and, and so forth. But there are different time constants, right? There's a time constant associated with the rotational inertia of the turbo machinery, and there's a time constant associated with how fast you can increase or decrease the fuel flow rate. So if you want to decrease the power, let's just say you want to cut the power by a factor of two. If you just do a throttle, if you just pop the throttle back and inject half the amount of fuel into the combustion chamber, well, the amount of air going through your combustion chamber, that hasn't changed in that short amount of time. Um, so what you did was you just kind of made a step change of a factor of two of your fuel air ratio, and you'll probably blow your flame out. And so, so the, the, uh, in, in aircrafts, as, as I mentioned, the transient, how quickly you can decrease the power is controlled by the need to avoid lean blowout in the combustion system. All right? In the same way, on the other end, how quickly you can increase the power is controlled by the need to avoid rich blowout. Okay, but again, this stuff is all, when, when, you, when, you, when you fly in an airplane, there are all these tests that go on where they have to certify um, lean and rich blowout events. So the pilot is doing one thing, but there's this whole control system which is tweaking what the pilot wants to do to make sure that you don't blow the engine out. And so what can happen, again, uh, if you want to get more power out of the system, if you, you just throw the throttle forward, you start pumping more fuel into the combustion chamber, well, it takes a certain amount of time for the turbo machinery to rev up, and, you, and, and so you increase the fuel air ratio locally and you can get rich blowout. All right, so that's transient response needs. Um, actually, I already talked about blow off, but, but these, these are just some, just some images. Um, in particular, we're spending a lot of time working on the blow off problem because low NOx designs, because you're operating with very, uh, low flame temperatures, they make flame stabilization more problematic. This is uh, the SR1, SR71. This, I like this picture because it shows what blowout is. Blowout is not extinction of the flame, it's just the flame decides to leave the building, so to speak, right? It has gone. Um, and uh, this is, a, this is a, I like this one because, um, th again, uh, most of my case studies are from the United States, but this is an advisory from NERC. NERC is the North American Electric Reliability Corporation. It's basically a consortium that's responsible for overseeing the stability of the U.S. grid system. And this is an advisory. This is from 2008. And it's talking about a, a significant grid fault that happened. In this case, it was in Florida. And you can read here what happened. It says, indications are that six combustion turbine generators, so these are big gas turbines, within the region that were operating in a lean burn mode used for reducing emissions. So you all understand this stuff. So it's a, it's, it's a lean premix system for low NOx. They tripped offline as a result of a phenomenon known as turbine combustor lean blowout. So this just shows you that, in this case, the overall grid that, that this problem of blowout led to this significant grid fault in, in Texas, and in, in, in Florida, and it, and it caused load shedding. Um, so that's blowout. And then lastly, the, uh, the problem of, of auto-ignition, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on auto-ignition uh, in this course because it's much more of a kinetically controlled phenomenon, and some of the other speakers are. I will just note, if I go back to this picture, that I had here, that as soon as you, when you once you premix fuel in the air here, you are creating, you'd like the flame to happen here. You want, you want to have some, some time for that mixture to get as homogeneous as possible to minimize NOx, but you create the potential for auto ignition. Um, now, if you are in a, um, in a power plant burning natural gas, 
Well, methane is really hard to auto-ignite, so it's usually not much of an issue. Um, <clears throat> however, in an aircraft engine where you're going to be burning Jet A, which has a lot, has, has much longer carbon chain lengths. In fact, uh, Professor Sashadri nicely showed, one of his second to last slides was, was he showed a temperature, an ignition temperature, and you could clearly see that as you went from, what was it, heptane to decane to dodecane, the temperature at which it auto-ignited. So auto-ignition is a big, it's, it is one of the key problems associated with low NOx aircraft engines. Um, so when, when companies are trying to develop premix designs, for aircraft engines operating at pressure ratios of 50, where the temperature, the, the cold air temperature coming into the combustor might be, you know, 1400 degrees Fahrenheit. And then you're taking these, these, um, these complex hydrocarbons that, that auto-ignite at, you know, temperatures of, you know, a few hundred degrees Fahrenheit. Um, avoiding that, the, the, the auto-ignition problem is, 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 is quite severe. Um, the other, actually, what I'm showing you on this picture here is this, this is a picture of a, um, this was given to me by a guy named Brian Ego at Siemens. This is, I believe, with methane, uh, with, with natural gas, which is dominantly methane. But the place where you can have auto-ignition problems with, with power generation systems, even if the fuel is not liquid, it's because natural gas always has a certain amount of higher hydrocarbons, right? So natural gas is composed of, I don't know what the composition is in India. Does anybody know? What was that? Exactly. It comes from, it depends where you're getting it from, right? In fact, actually that was the slide I jumped over where this just shows natural gas compositions from all over the world um, right here. This is a plot showing percentage of methane. This is a plot showing percentage of C2 plus constituents. So C2 plus would be everything that's not uh, CH4. It would be ethane, C2H6, or propane, C3H8, butane, C4H10, and so forth. Um, so they just, they're just bundling all that here. These lines right here, these are lines of constant diluent or, or inert, because there's also, depending on where it's coming from, you can have carbon dioxide and nitrogen. Um, but this just shows you these changes. But you can imagine that as you're going from, say, this natural gas here, which is 95% methane, to this one here coming from Brazil, which has 25% higher hydrocarbons, this one's going to auto-ignite a whole lot easier than this one will be. Um, but also, still going back to the point I wanted to make, what this says, this is an interesting issue that, that you have to deal with in designing of the, the whole fuel control system, is you really have to be careful about controlling the dew point. So imagine you have some big fuel control valves um, which you're using to control the flow rate. Well, because methane is, is, is nowhere close to a perfect gas, you can get Joule Thompson cooling when you throttle it. And so the local temperature can drop. Methane stays a gas, but maybe the propane that was in the, in the fuel drop, becomes a liquid. All right, so you now you had a, a mixture, it was gaseous, it was homogeneous. Now all of a sudden you have liquid propane drops at the exit of your fuel control valve. If, and, and it doesn't have time to revaporize. And so what you're doing is you're injecting maybe 100% pro, pure propane droplets into the system. And those can be ignition sites for auto-ignition, which can then propagate into the whole system. OK. All right. I have um, now fully used up the 45 minutes for my introduction and outlook. And I'm only one bullet of the four done. So. What we're going to do is jump over this stuff. That's OK, because I already talked about all of them sort of in a quick way. Maybe I'll just, uh, I'll just wrap up by just talking real quickly, just again from the intro, is, is Combustion in a, in a CO2 constrained world. I don't know how many of you were following what was happening in Paris last week. And India was very, very much in the news um, uh, as part of those discussions. But, you know, what, 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 you know, as we start looking at an increasingly carbon strained world, what are, what are the, for steady flowing combustion devices, what, you know, what are the, um, 
of the combustion challenges. Well, first of all, note that the combustor does not set CO2 emissions, right? The job of a good combustor is to make CO2. So the CO2 emissions of a device are set by the fuel you use, you know, in particular, for example, if it's a hydrocarbon, the C to H ratio, um, and your cycle choice, right? If you have a cycle that's really inefficient, if the thermal efficiency is low, you're going to be putting out more CO2 per, per unit power output than a device with higher CO2. And so what that does is it sets the combustion configuration and challenges. What it also means is that we're going to be looking, problems around high pressure combustion are, become, are going to be more and more important because again, going back, what sets thermal efficiency of, of pretty much any steady flowing device is going to be some sort of compressor pressure ratio. And so we're going to be looking to go to higher and higher compressor pressure ratios. Um, also, there is lots of interest and if you're going to be capturing the carbon, um, you're going to either be doing, if you're going to do it pre-combustion, so if you're going to be, be kept pulling the carbon out of the fuel before combustion, what that generally means is you're going to be wanting to gasify the fuel. If, if, it's, not, if it's not already a gas, so like if it's coal, you're going to want to gasify it. Um, and what you're going to end up with is, is a high hydrogen fuel. So, Burning high hydrogen fuels is very, very interesting as we look towards a, low, a lower carbon uh, world for pre-combustion carbon capture. For post-combustion carbon capture, with, by, by that what I mean is that you're actually referring to pulling the CO2 out um, after the combustion process. Well, generally what you're interested in doing there is um, driving up the CO2 concentration in the exhaust gases so that the because otherwise, the, you know, it's just thermodynamically, it's inefficient to, to, to separate one gas from another. And so the higher the CO2 concentration is, the better. And so that starts driving you towards configurations with extensive levels of, ex levels of exhaust gas recirculation. So then you start looking at, at a very interesting combustion problem there is just kinetics of combustion in the presence of significant levels of carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is not an inert. Um, it's very, very chemically active. It, it, it has lots of interesting influences on the flame. Um, or possibly also combustion in the presence of very high levels of steam. Again, water or steam, not chemically inert. It's not like nitrogen. Um, it has very, very significant influences on your radical pool. Um, and then the last thing that this drives you toward is starting to look at biofuels or fuels with near zero net CO2 emission. And again, this this brings the whole question that um, Professor Sashadri was talking about, the issue around surrogates. You know, one of the big challenges with, with these liquid fuels is that the fuel comp, there's just the, you know, the pallet, the, 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 the number of constituents of these fuels is, is, is there's, there's so many of them and it's so variable. As you start looking at biofuels, depending upon where your fuel source is coming from, whether it's an algae-derived source or whether it uh, comes from um, maybe uh, uh, Fischer trope catalysis of, of, um, of uh, some synthesis gas, which comes from some biological feedstock. The fuel composition changes a lot, which creates all these fuel flexibility challenges that I referred to before. Um, one of the other, actually, one of the points which I'll make for you, which is a really interesting one, we're starting to spend a lot of time working on this problem at Georgia Tech. We, we just got a Department of Energy grant to look at this, is the whole NOx efficiency trade off. Now, the, the, the NOx efficiency trade-off has been well known for reciprocating engines for many, many years, where you're basically trading, you're, you're having to make a decision of whether you want to prioritize carbon dioxide emissions or, or NO emissions. It's really been a non-issue for, um, for steady flowing devices, for boilers or for, for gas turbines. But what's happening is, is that, that the technology is getting to the point where, in fact, it's starting to become a significant issue. And just to, uh, just to illustrate that, what I have here is a plot of, um, this, is, this is a calculation, this is a detailed kinetic calculation showing NO emissions as a function of flame temperature, and I believe this assumes a 20 millisecond residence time. And you know, the NO emissions are, it's in a logarithmic scale, and so as you know, as you go up in temperature, you get an exponential increase in NO emissions. Well, historically, what's controlled, well, not historically, what, what always controls your, your, your combustor exit temperature in a, in, a, in a gas turbine type application is the turbine inlet temperature. And that turbine inlet temperature has historically been below a value where you get significant NOx formation. So, you know, kind of a, a rule of thumb, 
that I think we, we real like to throw around is that if you want to minimize NO formation, keep your flame temperature below about 1800K. I don't know, does that, a, does that sound familiar or reasonable? 1800-ish K. Above 1800K, the, the NOx formation rates start to, to start to really become significant. Well, if your turbine inlet temperature is less than 1800K, that's no problem. All it means is that you just need to tailor your temperature distribution within your combustion chamber to stay below 1800K. But what if you want your turbine inlet temperature to be 1900K or 1950K? Well, that's a big, then, then that creates a big challenge. And, and, and so, for example, in the United States, there's a, a large initiative from one of our big energy funders, the Department of Energy, and there is a goal that by 2020, we will have a combined cycle power plant that is 65% efficient, thermal efficiency. And you can do the math. This is, there's, it's not rocket science. You can go do the math and say, to get 65% combined cycle efficiency, what does my turbine limit temperature have to be? It has to be 1,975K, all right? So we're starting to talk about combustors where the temperatures are way above the temperatures at which you get significant NO formation. So we're doing that to minimize CO2 emissions, but then you start saying, well, hold on. The whole reason we're doing this stuff, this premix designs, is, is that we're trying to keep our temperatures low to minimize um, NO formation. So how do we start, how do we make designs that can operate at relatively, at, at, at high temperatures, but slow down the NO formation rate? So that's a very interesting problem, I think, is, is how do we completely rethink, how do we tailor the radical print? radical pool, for instance, to minimize uh, Zeldovich Knox formation at elevated temperatures. Okay, I guess just to, just to wrap up this first part, which went a little bit long, but that's okay. I think the main thing I want to point out for those of you is there's a, there's a lot of really interesting combustion challenges, um, and, and I've laid out a few of them. Um, where's that coming? Is that mine? Oh, okay. The, uh, so I set all these alarms so I wouldn't oversleep this talk. I just flew in this morning, and so I got alarms going off. I didn't know where it was. Um, you know, associated with fuel flexibility, with, with emissions, uh, operating in high efficiency cycles, having good operational flexibility. And actually, the last one I'll throw in here, you know, this sometimes as, as scientists, we don't always like to think about low cost. We think, well, that's somebody else's job. But how to do some of these things with intrinsically simpler, simpler designs. How do you make an intrinsically simple combustion design that can operate over a whole range of power settings, that's low NOx, that doesn't have combustion instabilities? That's kind of like the, the really, really big problem. Because you can do anything you want if you're willing to pay for it. But, you know, that's, 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 that's what was talked about in Paris, right, with the CO2, is that, you know, this stuff costs money. <coughs> okay. Does anyone have any questions? All right, so feel free to stop me at any point, and we will um, go on to the next topic, which is flame aerodynamics and flashback. So what I want to talk about here is this is, again, it's a very practical problem, um, but it also, there's a whole host of really interesting, neat science problems that arise out of it. And that's this problem, both of what I'll call flashback and flame holding. So flashback, I think you'll probably all know what it is. It's the upstream propagation of a premix flame into a region that's not designed for the flame to exist. And as soon as you go to a premix design, you create the potential for flashback. So when does flashback occur? Well, it's kind of obvious, but a flashback occurs when the laminar and or the turbulent flame speed exceeds the local flow velocity. All right. But now, this then raises the question of, all right, so if we want to just kind of scale things, figure out, you know, when will flashback be a problem? What's a reference flow speed? If you have a, if you have a flow with, with a, if you have a, a, a combustion system with some approach flow velocity of whose average value is, say, U naught, is that the reference flow speed that you should use for evaluating flashback propensity? Well, you, know, you, you all know that combustors have boundary layers, and so there are regions where the local flow velocity will be less than U0. So it may not be. And in fact, as I'll talk about, the, 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 the flame itself changes the local flow velocity. The other question is, what's your reference burning velocity, right? Is it the laminar unstretched flame speed? Um, however, 
flames, if, particularly if they're propagating in boundary layers, are propagating in regions where there's very high flame stretch, right? There's, there's high degrees of, of, of um, shear that the flames are sitting in, which, which stretches the flame, it changes its internal structure, and can substantially change the local burning rate. And so this rather obvious comment, bullet, um, quickly becomes much more complicated when you recognize that, in fact, it's not obvious what both either the reference flow speed should be or the reference burning velocity should be to evaluate flashback. And um, so, in fact, if, if, um, you know, if you look in, for example, Lewis, I don't know if any of you have Lewis and Von Elby's combustion book where they talk a lot about flashback and they have some simple scaling rules. It's just, I'd say, in the last five years, it's been realized that there's a whole lot more to this problem. And I think people thought this was kind of a classic problem that, that people had figured out. But there's a whole lot more to this problem um, than just some of those, those basic characteristics that you derive from a, an open Bunsen flame. Um, <coughs> okay, so let's, uh, let's, let's just jump up here and let's talk about flashback a little bit more. So there's, one of the things that makes life interesting is that there's multiple mechanisms whereby a flame can propagate upstream. So first of all, you can get flashback in the boundary layer. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, you can also get flashback in the core flow. So, um, and we're going to specifically focus our discussion here when we talk about flashback in core flows. We'll talk about swirl flows. Because as I will show you, one of the very interesting things about combustion in a swirl flow is the flame can completely change the flow field that the flame is propagating into. So for example, a, um, a, a, a nice analogy for flashback is think, you have a power boat, you're in a river, and you want to go upstream, right? Your power boat goes max speed 10 miles an hour. The river has an average velocity of 40 miles an hour, okay? So you're going to get washed downstream in your power boat, right? Unless, well, there's two, there's two ways you can go upstream. One is you can maybe go right along the bank in the boundary layer, right, where the velocity drops from 40 miles an hour to something lower. Maybe if you don't get the propeller stuck in the reeds, you can go, you can go upstream, right? That might be one thing. And that's, that's boundary layer flashback, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. The other way is, is if you could come up with some really nifty, cool device maybe using plasmas and lasers or something, where you could make the water in front of you just part. Like, if you know the story of Moses in the Bible, right? Where he just had the water part. Um, where if the water in front of you, if you could just make it magically slow down, and then obviously the continuity equation still has to hold, so and then accelerate around you, right? But that's not, I'm not making that up. That's what flames do when you have high swirl flows. In fact, the flames, the flame, can cause the flow in front of it to stagnate. And, 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 and so the flame can actually propagate into a flow where the time average velocity is higher than the flame speed, um, which is this flashback mechanism in core flows. It's very, very interesting. We'll talk about it. Third mechanism, we're not going to get into this directly, but another place where you oftentimes get flashback is when you get combustion instabilities, when you get large amplitude pulsations in the flow. Um, you, the flow can actually for certain time instances, reverse itself, go backwards. And, um, and in fact, in, in real devices, oftentimes when a, a, a power plant might trip, for instance, during a combustion instability, it will trip because the flame flashes back and it starts melting hardware. And so <coughs> I have a couple pictures here of different, um, th there's been a lot of work, by the way, done by, the, by um, Thomas Saddlemeyer at, at, at TU Munich's group on this. This would be an illustration of flame flashback in the core flow. So here's your combustor walls. This is showing you the flow is swirling. Um, and this is, you see the flame propagating upstream in the core. This right here is an annular flow passage. Um, so the flow is going bottom to top. You can see this flame is coming back. It's flashing back in the boundary layer. There's a, there's a center body of the flow, in the flow. This, is, this would be the outer wall. This dashed line would be the center line. You can see the flame is flashing back in the, um, the shear layer, the, the, the boundary layer of this, of this inner annulus. Okay, well, let's talk first a little bit about boundary layer flashback. And I want to start with the, the, the classical treatment. All right, so you've probably seen this when you take, take in combustion. And the key thing about this classical treatment 
is it neglects the effect of heat release and it neglects the effect of stretch. We'll talk about that for a minute. But basically the idea is, is let's assume that your flame speed, <coughs> your laminar flame speed is everywhere less than, excuse me, is, is, is less than, than, than the, um, the, the average flow speed. If in that case, the only place where the flame can possibly flash back is in a boundary layer, right? And so just to illustrate that, here would be a picture where the flow is going left to right, right? And velocity, th this is the axial velocity. It goes to zero at the wall, and then it increases away from the wall. And I haven't shown it. it um, and it's going to reach some, if it's a turbulent flow anyway, or, um, it'll, you know, it'll reach some, some average value. And then the derivative, the, the slope of this gradient, this velocity gradient, which sets the wall shear stress, dux by dy, is, is indicated by this dashed line. And then here's your flame. All right, and so if the flame is flashing back, um, what that means is, is that the flame can find a location where the local burning velocity, let's say that this SL would be the, the, the flame speed. Actually, I'm, just to be consistent, I'm calling this SD. Uh, SD, the, um, I'm going to be a little bit anal here differentiating between consumption speeds and displacement speeds. Displacement speeds is the speed at which the flame moves with respect to the flow. So the subscript D denotes displacement. The U is going to denote the, um, the displacement speed with respect to the unburned to the reactants, as opposed to a superscript B would be with respect to the products, the burned products. All right. Anyway, if the flame is obviously it's going to quench if it's uh, there's going to be some quenching distance where the flame will quench if it's uh, near the wall, but and, and near the wall is where the velocity is lowest. But if the velocity if the flame is propagating faster than the flow velocity in the region outside of the quenching layer, it can it can flash back in the boundary layer, and so <coughs> that's what I'm showing here. Here, uh, flashback will occur if the flame speed ex exceeds the flow velocity at a distance del q. Del q would be the, the quenching distance from the wall. So if the axial velocity, ux, at this distance, at y equals the quenching distance, if that's equal to the displacement speed at y equals the quenching distance, that's kind of your critical flashback condition. So again, this is classical stuff, straight out of Lewis and von Elby's book. Um, and so what we can do is we know since the velocity is starting from zero, we can actually expand it in the Taylor series. And we can say, OK. So the axial velocity at y equals um, del q, well, that will equal the axial velocity at y equals 0 plus dux by dy times del q. But because the axial velocity is 0 at y equals 0, the only, this, this is the leading order term of that expansion. All right? And so the axial velocity is um, a, a first order approximation of the axial velocity at the quenching distance would be given by this expression. The, this gradient times the quenching distance. And this gradient is oftentimes called, um, given the, 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 um, in, in the in the combustion literature, given the symbol G. Um, and, and so what we can do then is if we go back to this expression and equate basically G times del Q is equal to SD, we can replace that <coughs> by this critical condition that the critical the velocity gradient at the wall times the quenching distance divided by the flame speed, when that's equal to 1, that will be the critical condition for flashback. Um, and in fact, so this is this is basically a Karlovitz number. So we can define a, a Karlovitz number. And so, it, so what you can do is you can go back to lots of classical data that's in the literature. And so in, in my book, we, we, we did this. So there's some, there's some classical flashback data from, from you know, 1954 and 1955. This shows you that data where they measured the critical velocity gradient as a function of fuel air ratio. So you can see that, um, you know, for example, at an equivalence ratio of 1, the critical velocity gradient has to be high to avoid flashback, whereas if the equivalence ratio is lean, the critical velocity gradient can be lower. Um, makes sense. Uh, these lines here are for different reactant temperature. Uh, T superscript U. Again, this, the superscript denotes the U means unburned, the, the temperature of the, of the unburned reactants. So the critical velocity gradient has to be higher as you go up in reactant temperature. Well, now, 
you can take that data, you can then calculate, you can use detailed kinetics. That's the beauty of, of, of nowadays. We have these wonderful tools, um, and we can calculate flame thicknesses, and we can calculate flame speeds and things like that uh, with, without any empiricism, <coughs> or with less empiricism. We can actually go in and we can take these mixtures. They measured the value of GEU. We can calculate the flame thickness and the displacement speed. This is actually, I took, we took their data, the solid lines is methane data, where we're plotting that, that flashback Karlovitz number as a function of equivalence ratio. And you can see it's pretty darn close to being constant. The, uh, the open symbols are for propane. We'll talk about uh, that a little bit more later. But um, what it shows you is that we will be able that just using some very basic scaling, um, you know, you could collapse dependencies across a range of reactant temperatures or across a range of equivalence ratios just using modern kinetic tools. Okay, so anyway, this, this is some classic data, open flames, Bunsen flames. Now I want to, now I want to dig into um, uh, things that make life a little bit more interesting. Um, so, tell you what, let, me, let me just jump up to here. So, the first key point that I want, I want to get into is that, in fact, this analysis, you might ask, how do we make these assumptions? You know, I told you that this classical treatment neglected the effect of heat release and it neglected the effect of stretch. Somebody tell me, where did I neglect the effect of heat release in this analysis? Pardon? Yep, and, 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 and I'm basically assuming that this, that this velocity gradient is imposed on the flame, right? That I, that I specify that, it, that if I have a given burner, I design a velocity gradient, you know, which would basically be a boundary layer thickness, that I, that I specify that I impose that on the flame. In reality, as I want to talk about, is the flame influences the velocity field. And so anyway, so where we've neglected heat release in this analysis, or, or, or implicitly neglected it, is that we, that we um, implicitly assumed that we knew what the velocity field was. Um, OK, well, let's talk a little bit uh, for a minute about, look, let's just back up and just talk in general. Whenever you have a flame that is curved, a premix flame that is curved, it changes the flow field. So here, here, what, here I have a, um, a calculation. Just illustrating the idea. Premix flame is this dashed line. This is the approach flow. All right. <coughs> the the, the, the arrows denote the, the, the velocity field. And what you can see here is, is that when the flame bulges into the reactants right here, what does that do? It actually causes the flow velocity, it causes the flow to diverge. The flow diverges in front of the flame, and it causes the flow to decelerate in front of the flame. Whereas the part of the, if, if the flame, I can never remember what's concave and convex. Um, if you have this situation, you can see that you get this focusing effect, right? That the, that the velocity vectors converge and they accelerate. Um, and so coming back to this point, so when your flame bulges into the reactants, the bottom part of this picture, you know, I just drew this sinusoidal perturbation on a flame. It causes the approach flow to decelerate. It causes streamlines to diverge. The other thing it does is actually imposes an adverse pressure gradient on the flow. So flames, whenever you have a flame that um, bulges into reactants, it's, it's back pressuring the flow. Well, let's think about what are some of the implications of that. Well, first of all, let's just think about boundary layers. What that means is if you have a flame, like if we go back to this picture that I drew here, curved flame bulging into the reactants, <clears throat> this flame is actually going to be causing the approach flow right in front of it to decelerate. It's going to impose an adverse pressure gradient. What do boundary layers think of adverse pressure gradients? They don't like them, right? They, they cause boundary layer separation. Um, or at least they can introduce a deficit in the local velocity. Um, we'll get into this a little bit more later, but in swirl flows, if you, if, if, you impose an adverse pressure gradient on a swirl flow, you can induce a phenomenon called vortex breakdown. 
whereby the, you get a stagnation point in the flow. We'll talk about that a little bit more later. Somebody have a question? Yes, sir. Yeah, actually, yeah, we'll get into that in just a second. But uh, it doesn't cause the flame to propagate. It doesn't cause the flame speed necessarily to go up, but it causes the flame to move with respect to the flow velocity. Um, so the other application, you, some of you may be familiar with, with triple flames. Um, what do I got to do here? The computer went to sleep. While, that, while I'm waiting for that, let me just come to this last one. So, how many of you have heard of the Darius Landau instability of premixed flames? Okay. So, it turns out that um, if you take any, any constant burning velocity premixed flames, so let me ignore stretch effects for, for the minute, for a moment. <coughs> but it turns out that any constant burning velocity front that propagates normal to itself is unstable. And it's unstable for the exact reason that was noted here. So in other words, if I take a flame and I have the local flame speed match the flow speed, if I put a perturbation on the flame, so I do this, what will happen here? Well, if I perturb the flame here, it causes the local flow velocity to decelerate. Well, again, I'm going to assume I'm going to neglect stretch effects for a minute. But if the flame speed is constant, now all of a sudden the local flame speed is going to be higher than the flow velocity, so the flame is going to propagate farther out. In the same way, the part that's, that's trailing back, now the flame speed will be less than the flow velocity, and, this will, and so the bulge will grow. Right? So this is the essence of the Darius-Landau instability. And it's an aerodynamic effect. It's the fact that you have, um, you have the, the flame acts as a gas dynamic discontinuity, and the gas expansion across the flame are coupled with, with curvature of the flame changes the approach flow field. The flame changes the flow field that's in front of it. That's the Darius Landau instability. The other place this shows up, for those of you who work on non premix flames, you may know this problem that if you have what am I doing wrong here? Pardon? Yeah, I am. I'm having a rough day. I think it might have. Went. It worked first. Try again. So, fuel. Oxidizer. This is a splitter plate. So, how many of you have seen this problem? Well, I wish. Can I switch colors? Cool. Eraser. Okay. Anyway, so many of you have seen this problem where you have a, a, a triple flame, where you have the non premix flame and then you have the fuel rich premix branch and the fuel lean premix branch. If you actually calculate the local flow velocity, um, well, bottom line is the, the non premix, this, this non premix, uh, <coughs> excuse me, this uh, triple flame does the same thing. It causes the flow to, to, to do one of these things. So the flame can actually sit in a region of the flow that's higher velocity than you would expect based upon the, uh, if, if you think that, the, that this part of the flame is going to be propagating at the flame speed of a phi equals one flame, a stoichiometric flame. In fact, the flame can sit in a region of the flow which has a higher velocity than you would expect because the flame decelerates the approach flow. So it's all, the, it's the, all these different things all flow out of the same basic effect that if you have an exothermic curved front, it changes the flow field in front of it. So that's why you get the Darius Landau instability. That's why triple flames do what they do. And this is also why we can do some other things. Yes, sir. Uh, 
Well, premix flames <coughs> propagate normal to themselves. That's a key feature of premix flames. You know, the local normal well, okay, so the flow does not have to be normal to the flame. You know, you can have a, premix flames, you can, you, you, in general, do have a tangential component of the flow with respect to the flame. But the flame is propagating normal to itself. So, the, the, we, can, we, can dif, we can define three velocities um, for premix flames. The flame speed, which is the speed with which the flame propagates with respect to the flow, the flow velocity, and then the velocity of the flame sheet. Okay? The velocity of the flame sheet is the vector summation of the flow velocity vector plus the flame speed, which is a scalar, um, propagated in the direction normal to the flame sheet. Yep. Uh, scalar dissipation rate's too high, so it extinguishes. Otherwise, yeah. So if the, if flame had infinitely fast chemistry, it would sit on the splitter plate, and you wouldn't have the the, the triple flame, right? But but the scalar dissipation rate is enormous, right there, and so it always lifts a little bit. You get some premixing. Okay, um, so just to illustrate these ideas, um, the, the, I guess the, the, the bottom line coming back to the stretched flame example is that in reality what the flame can do is it actually can cause, it, 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 it can and does decelerate the approach flow. All right? In extreme cases, it can even cause um, the boundary layer to flash back. Uh, excuse me, the boundary layer to separate. So what happens is, is the flame, here's the flow. If, if the flame starts to flash back, the boundary layer separates. And now I have negative flow velocity. Well, negative flow velocity means the flame is being sucked upstream, right? Now the next point on the flow back here, that causes the boundary layer to separate. So the flame propagates upstream and, and, and so forth. So you get this this feedback effect where the flame changes the flow, and now the flow is in a, gives you this favorable condition for, for flame advancement upstream. It does that, and it changes the flow again. And I thought I had a movie here, but I don't know where it went. Oh, here it is. Um, this is, this is some, some really nice data um, just showing this, this same basic effect. This is a... Uh, a detail, I showed you this movie earlier where I showed you this flame propagating upstream. This is, this, uh, what you're actually looking at is the seed particles. Um, they're disappearing across the flame. You can actually map out the flow velocity in that same configuration. Here's the flow velocity. So you see how the flow is, is kind of diverging around the flame, right? So the black is the instantaneous flame. But what's really interesting is what I've drawn here is I've hatched in the region of the flow velocity that's negative. Okay, so the flow in this region or in this region here is going upstream. So without the flame, you would have the flow only going in one direction, forward, right? In the presence of the flame, the flame actually creates a region of separated flow in front of it, which causes the flame to move, move upstream. So the approach flow is basically getting, is sucking the flame back into the nozzle. Um, am I supposed to be done at 12.30? Okay. All right, so I guess just in the same way, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll just stop. I'll, I, I think I'm going to move on to swirl flows here next. But I guess the main point I wanted to make here is the flame changes the flow, thereby completely changing the picture. This is not a slight derivative change. I mean, it is a completely different change, right? The flame has caused boundary layer separation, which causes and it, which is causing you this flashback phenomenon. So you could actually, just from a simple, you know, if you, if you did the, the, the straightforward analysis that I showed you over here for an open, where a flame is just going into an open Bunsen flame, and you could say, this flow will never flash back because it meets these criteria. You know, maybe I'm, 
Uh, remember, if you're above this line, you're, you are flashback safe. If you're below the line, you'll flashback. Well, you could, you could actually, in, in, re, in, in more realistic geometries, be in a region where you would predict from these you know, Lewis and von Elbe type, type analysis, where you would say the flame can never flash back. In reality, the flame could flash back, and the mechanism is through what I've just showed you, is that the flame changes the flow because of flame curvature. Yeah? Where is heat release coming in? Well, heat release causes gas expansion. And gas expansion, and so because this is a subsonic problem, the flow field is controlled by everything, right? And so the gas expansion causes post-flame acceleration. And so when you actually work through the analysis, what happens is, is that gas expansion across a curved front changes the, the, the flow field in front of the front. You know, when, you, when you just you sit down and you can solve the, the momentum and continuity equations. Yeah, it's, it's specifically it's because of the back pressuring of the flow. That because, going back to this picture here, Remember, I, I told you that the flow is diverging in front of the flame, which you could see in the data. But also, because the flow is diverging, what causes, because the flow is diverging, because the streamlines are diverging, the approach flow is decelerating. If the flow is decelerating, how do, you, how do you decelerate a flow? It requires the pressure to be rising, right? It requires an adverse pressure gradient. So the, and the boundary layer sees that adverse pressure gradient, and it separates. And so you get the reverse flow. Uh, well, life's a little bit more complicated with this situation, right? Because it's it's a highly permeable surface. I'm not sure whether you could use that as a direct analogy. All right. Um, yep. Anyone else have a question? Yes. Yeah. 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 You can you can cool the wall, or you can add dilution air to the to the wall to to reduce this effect. But, uh, Increasing the temperature so that the reaction rate also goes up near the wall. If you suppose if you heat up the wall, that would that would that would exacerbate the flashback problem. Yeah. By the way, I didn't I didn't have time to get into this, but in the reason that this effect doesn't show up at all in a lot of those classical experiments is because they do, um, but they the way they work is you basically take a tube. You stabilize a flame outside of a Bunsen flame, and then you just start decreasing the velocity until the flame flashes back. Well, what happens is, is that when you have a flow going from an open tube into the atmosphere, there's just such a massive adverse pressure gradient when you're going from a confined flow to an open flow because the flow is decelerating. That adverse pressure gradient completely buries the adverse pressure gradient that the flame would impose on the flow, so you just don't see it. Um, I mentioned that there's this, been this recent set of work by, by uh, Saddlemeyer's group. Um, the way they were able to catch this was they, they looked at flashback for a confined flow. So they basically did a situation that, like this. You have a tube with a small lip on it. They stabilize the flame on the lip. Now you don't have near that adverse pressure gradient just due to a, due to a flow exhausting into an ambient. And that's where they could see this effect in a significant way. So in fact, this is some of their data where they took um, an unconfined flame, this is the um, critical velocity gradient as a function of fuel-air ratio. As soon as they confined it, as soon as they went from just you know, an open Bunsen flame to a step, the critical velocity gradient you can see went up by about a factor of five. So it's a ma main thing is, is that, that the flame really, really changes the flow field. You cannot impose a flow field on a flame to, to look at problems like flashback. Um, 
Okay, let me just talk real quickly about core flow flashback because this is another really interesting problem. So I've talked about how flames can propagate upstream into boundary layers and the key mechanism being basically this aerodynamics problem is that the flame material alters the flow field which it's propagating into, the premixed flame. Now I want to talk about how um, flame propagation upstream in the core flow. And I want to show you how flames are like Moses, okay, how they can just part the waters in front of them if, 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 they, if in fact you have swirl flow. So first of all, how many of you are familiar with the phenomenon of vortex breakdown? Okay, so let me, let me explain it first of all. If you take a, a pipe flow, all right, and if all the flow is going in one direction and it has swirl, so the flow is not only going axially but it's spinning, that the degree of swirl on the flow has very profound influences on the, on the flow structure. The most prominent being that above a certain swirl number, you can get a phenomenon called vortex breakdown. All right? And what vortex breakdown is, is it actually you, the, you develop a stagnation, an axial stagnation point in the flow. So just to illustrate that, here I have a picture. Flow is going left to right. If it's swirling, if you have vortex breakdown, the time average velocity field will look something like this. All right? So you have this stagnation point here where the axial velocity is zero stagnation point here where the velocity is zero. And you get this recirculating cell of fluid. And so to the outer flow, the flow that's going around it, it almost looks like you just stuck an obstacle in the middle of the flow, an ellipsoid of revolution in the middle of the flow that the flow has to go around. All right? So it's kind of a, it's, it's kind of a really neat thing. You could say, if you have a, so what I'm saying is if you have a pipe, the flow is going 100 miles an hour through that pipe. It's just really moving. If you add swirl, if you add enough swirl, what you will do is you will actually create a point where the axial velocity goes to zero without any solid surface required. You don't need a shear layer or you don't need a boundary layer. Just this phenomenon of vortex breakdown. It's, a vort it's, it's an instability of swirl flows. All right? And so just to illustrate this, these are some smoke visualizations of, of swirl flows with vortex breakdown, just a bunch of different ones. Here you have a jet flow. Here's the jet. The flow is going left to right. So you see the high velocity jet, it's, it's a swirling jet, and notice how the, the flow, it diverge, all of a sudden you see the jet fluid splitting into two. There's an upper and a lower branch, and, the, and what's happening in the middle is there's this recirculating flow structure. Some pretty complicated fluid mechanic instabilities. Here, they just seeded the, the center line of the flow, and you can see the, that this, this it's, you can see here that this, it, it's moving around something. Here's another image of it, you can see uh, where they let the whole bubble fill up. Um, so the, the bottom line is, I'm almost out of time here, but, but for high enough values of azimuthal, or, or high enough values of azimuthal velocity with respect to the flow velocity, you get this phenomenon called vortex breakdown. So what happens is, is that, again, vortex breakdown, I'm, as I mentioned earlier, it's sensitive to, to adverse pressure gradients. In fact, the reason I drew this picture here, you'll, you might wonder, why did I draw this step here? Well, if you just have a straight duct with enough swirl, you get vortex breakdown. But if, it, but if the duct has constant diameter, vortex breakdown could occur anywhere. Um, and just to illustrate that, if, uh, whoops, you know, so if here's a pipe, here's axial flow, and it's swirling, it's spinning around. What can happen is vortex breakdown can happen here. You see that? Or it could happen here, or it could happen here. And in reality, it'll kind of meander around randomly. All right, so, and where, remember what vortex breakdown is, is you get this bubble of recirculating fluid. Here's the stagnation point, and it's recirculating flow, and the flow goes around it. But the velocity is zero here, right? Remember this velocity, this flow could be going I said 100 miles an hour, it could be going 500 miles an hour. But it comes to a screeching halt right there. Stops. Okay? But this point moves around. But if, it turns out that if, if you put a, a, an adverse pressure gradient, that, that can trip the vortex. It's a nonlinear effect, but you can trip the location of vortex breakdown. So the reason that I put this slight step in it, that slight step causes a slight adverse pressure gradient, and it will lock that vortex breakdown location. It stays put right there. Well, it turns out that, again, what, what did we just say about flames? We said flames cause adverse pressure gradients. So you can take a flow, 
and it can trip vortex breakdown. Okay, so here I just used this slight gas expansion to trip vortex breakdown. But suppose I had a flame, and it started to move upstream. It would cause vortex. It would cause this whole vortex breakdown pocket to move upstream. That flow velocity just went from a value much, much greater than the flame speed to zero. Okay, now, the, now that causes the flame to move farther upstream, it, which causes the vortex breakdown bubble to move upstream. And again, the flame changes the flow, and the flow changes the flame, and you get this feedback process. And that's what's being shown here. This is, this is an image from Thomas Saddlemeyer just showing this exact phenomenon, that the flow velocity is higher than the flame speed, but the flame trips vortex breakdown. So again, this is that, that example I gave of my boat. My boat can, goes less, it's everywhere, the flame speed is everywhere less than the average flow velocity, okay? Still, what's in the presence of swirl, in the presence of this fluid mechanic instability, the flame can cause the approach flow velocity in front of it to drop to a value below the flame speed, and then the flow just has to, because of the continuity equation, the, the flow has to accelerate around the flame, but then the flame moves forward, okay? So two examples here. Court, I've talked about boundary layer flashback, whereby the flame alters the stability of the boundary layer and causes boundary layer separation, or core flow flashback, where the flame interacts with the hydrodynamic stability of the swirling flow and causes the, the location of vortex breakdown. So Thomas Saddlemeyer, uh, he refers to this phenomenon as CIVB, which is, I'm not, I've not defined it anywhere, but that's combustion-induced vortex breakdown. So vortex breakdown is combustion-induced and interacts with it. Okay. 12.30, exactly. Does anyone have any questions? Yes, sir. In Kroner and Sutopia paper in Experimenting Fluid 2007, it's mentioned that polyclinic work, I mean polyclinic work that in vortex, vorticity equation, it uses the velocity acceleration of the stream of the flame pump. Okay? Uh, but this polyclinic work that is not forced, is not uh, force. Uh, can you help, us, uh, help me to understand this statement? So, okay, that's actually a really, really hard question. Um, the, the manner in which flames interact with swirling flows and change the flow field, there's been a, a whole variety of discussions around the mechanism for that. They speculated bear clinic, the bear clinic effect, which is where whenever you have a pressure gradient at an angle with respect to a density gradient, you, you, um, you introduce torque, which changes vorticity. I, I guess the, the, the we can take, the, that, that's, this is a much longer conversation. I think from my point of view, the, the main point is, is that adverse pressure gradients that the flame induce change the, the um, vortex breakdown location. It could be through interactions, the, 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 the more detailed internal mechanism through which that happens could be baroclinic torque. But, it's, but I would just note that that's, it's not, I don't think that issue is resolved. <coughs> Pressure gradient and density gradient induces a uh, vorticity product, any vorticity equation, but this is not a force to induce uh, no velocity. No, but, but bear clinic, the bear clinic torque term, what it does is it induces angular momentum, right? And so if you have a flow, if you have, if you induce, an, you know, the, the whole vortex breakdown stability argument relies very much on, um, the, the key idea here is that you induce a, um, that baroclinic torque looks like this, and it, it induces a velocity that's off-axis. But you're inducing a torque. You, you know, the, um, the uh, let me just illustrate. So, so for those of you who aren't familiar with this, the re baroclinic torque term shows up if, um, Suppose that this circle is a, um, a, a, uh, a control volume of fluid, right? And if the density, let's say the density is, these are these dashed lines in density isobars, let's say the density is rising here, 
These would denote these would de denote ISO density lines. If these denote ISO pressure lines, if you have a pressure gradient, so what I've drawn here is a picture where I have a control volume of fluid where the the um, pressure isobars are not aligned with the density isobars. You're going to be this would be a flow with where you'd be inducing a baroclinic uh, torque. Um, what's happening here is that this control volume, because the density is rising in this picture, it means the center of mass is not in the center. It's, it's going to be off center. Let's just suppose it's right there. Um, now I have a pressure gradient. The pressure gradient is going to be acting through the center of pressure, which is right here. And it's going to be acting in the direction of the, uh, of the isobars. So I have a net force acting through the center of pressure that looks like this. It's not acting through the center of mass, and I induce a torque. That, that was basically what's happening with the, that baroclinic term. Anyone else have a question? Yes, sir. Yep. The flow is being disturbed because of the flame. Um, the if in case of a combustion instability where the flame oscillates, the time scale associated with the flame oscillation, and will the flow respond to that kind of time scales? And how do we? Uh, yeah, so there's, there's absolutely a time scale phenomenon. Like particularly for the combustion instability problem, you can, you can imagine if it's very low frequency instability, the whole flame is going to be sloshing back and forth. Whereas if it might be you know, a kilohertz type instability, it wouldn't. So there's absolutely, absolutely there's a time scale as well uh, for, for question, pulsating flow. Yeah, my question was, will the flow divergence or convergence due to the flame, uh, will that happen with respect to the flame oscillation? Yeah, yeah, it will. You, know, you can work out a characteristic time associated with it. Um, in an incompressible, in an incompressible low mock flow, it's pretty fast. That time scale is pretty fast. Okay, we should probably wrap up, run over time a little bit. Thank you all.